This week, mangled limbs, cold corpses, and drowning blood. Death scythe cuts through companies as men are marched to the killing house under the beat of a drum. To honor each, the church bells must ring for a millennium. To name each would exhaust even the strongest lungs. But a trample over the remains is as simple as an order. Forward! Into hell. May 31st, Virginia. Major General Smith and his 18th Corps are lost. Seriously lost. He's supposed to be near the Cold Harbor Crossroads, working with the Cavalry Corps. But he can't make heads nor tails of his position. Finally, he figures it out and begins the march towards Old Cold Harbor. Hopefully, Cavalry Commander Torbert can hold out long enough. June 1st, General Anderson's tent. First Corps leader and General Hoke are in deep conversation. Hoke and his division are to follow the First Corps' assault, not in support, not working with, but follow up. Gaines Mill, the site of the battle that decides the fate of the rebellion in the summer of 1862, once again is the field of determination. Colonel Lawrence Kite is a politician, not an officer. Despite this lack of experience, he leads the former brigade of General Kershaw, now his division commander. He brings his eager men to the entrenching cavalry, who quickly do it over fire with their seven shot rifles. Kite falls down mortally wounded. His men fall back, leaving him to his mortal fate. General Lee had concentrated his forces, ready to seize the vile roads, but had accidentally left the details to his subordinates. General Kershaw calls back the assault, sending Hoke's men from the slaughter. Oh, 0900 hours, the men of the 6th Corps finally see their objective, reaching the blood-stained crossroads, begin to extend the entrenchments of Torbert. They are supposed to assault the rebels immediately, but the long march, lack of the reconnaissance, causes their commander, General Wright, to disregard Grant's orders and wait for General Smith, who should be here any moment any moment now. Noon passes. Finally, the 18th Corps arrives, and they begin to dig in two. Gabri falls back east, having completed their job. Grant wanted an assault in the morning. He can get one in the afternoon. General Meade, who commands the army, is worried. Wright and Smith are able commanders, but their men are exhausted. The enemy unknown, and possibly outnumbers them. Bethesda Church, warns HQ. The courier arrives to the 5th Corps commander. Generals Wright and Smith will attack this evening. It is very desirable you should join this attack, unless in your judgment it is impracticable. For some reason, General Gouverneur sends his least competent commander, Henry Lockwood, and his division to support the assault. The division has no knowledge of road networks, and Lockwood soon becomes lost, despite starting the march at 1800 hours, and this is the start of battle at 1830. A great yell. Men grab their rifles close to their breads, over the works. Blood fills the air. Wright and Smith watch as their corps move forward. Virginal Emery Upton and his brigade advance against Rebel Officer Clingmans. Despite Upton's military genius, his charge is disastrous. A sheet of flame, sudden as lightning, red as blood, and so near that it seemed to sign the men's faces. Emery can't even rally his men and has to fall back with them. To his right, there is more success. Colonel Truth exploits a gap in the Rebel line and captures a Georgian regiment, but he too is defeated, surrounded, and pushed back, leaving many men behind. All along the south does the rapid assault of the 6th and 18th Corps meet a bloody end. To the north, the three corps of the excellent General Winfield Hancock, the superb General Gouverneur K. Warren, and General Ambrose Burnside hold a five-mile line opposing the intelligent General A.P. Hill, the triumphant Jubal Early, and General Breckinridge is also there. Early senses weakness and sends forward Major Generals Robert E. Rhodes and John B. Gordon to strike along the marsh. The two divisions meet with General Crittenden, who, despite his regular amount of incompetence, repulses the assault. On the topic of ignorance, General Lockwood has been completely lost this entire time. In some unaccountable way, Lockwood took his whole division, without my knowing it, away from the left of the line of battle, and turned up the dark two miles in my rear. I have not yet got him back. All this time, the firing should have guided him at least. He is too incompetent, and too high rank leaves us no subordinate place for him. I earnestly beg that he may be at once relieved of duty with this army. Meade hears Warren's plea and does something I didn't know he could do. On the 2nd of June, places the 2nd Division under the 3rd Division commander, despite not merging the two. 2200 hours, the fighting stops. A combined 4,000 casualties of the day. The Union camp is split. General Meade argues with Grant. Why was time not given for reconnaissance? Why can't we wait for battle? What do you expect with blind charges? I'm sure General Gordon was more diplomatic. 
Grant believes, despite the ginormous cost, he has reason to be happy. The rebels are pinned, and their entrenchments are close. No giant open fields, a quick dash away. Dawn, the 2nd of June, Federal HQ. The dust has settled on the dead. Grant believes that a proper assault on the right flank of the rebels could doom the army of Lee. If success happens, the secessionists would be driven into the Chickahominy River. Meade, who is either on board with the idea or just under orders, wants Hancock to shift his forces to aid in the assault, giving the charge 35,000 men, while the 5th and 9th Corps are to engage the left to ensure the Confederates don't expect a thing. Hancock's men march all night, no time to sleep, so the attack is delayed till 1700 hours. They're still tired, so let's move to the 3rd. Now, how will it exactly be done? Who knows? Grant didn't give exact orders, and Meade left it up to the Corps commanders, who again are going in blind since no reconnaissance has been done. Aghast at the reception of such an order, which proved conclusively the utter absence of any military plan, simply an order to slaughter my best troops. General Lee doesn't waste a day. He moves Breckenridge to once again face off against Hancock, and even has Breckenridge take the dominating heights of Turkey Hill. He also moves two divisions of Hills and Fitzog Lee to guard the right. Seven mile line is created that can't be flanked. And that is only the movement portion shovel, spades, pickaxes. The engineers construct the most ingenious defensive configuration the war had yet witnessed. Intricate, zigzag lines within lines. Lines protecting flanks of lines. Lines built to enfilade an opposing line. It was a maze and labyrinth of works within works. Artillery positions, dirt barricades that can stop rifle fire, trenches protecting all but the head from shot. You might as well be assaulting the walls of Babylon. While Union High Command seems oblivious to this, the common rank and file aren't. They have survived Fredericksburg, Gettysburg, and Spotsylvania. They know tonight could be their last. According to an officer, some men write their names and pin it to their uniforms, so if they happen to fall, they might be identified. Some write letters home as if they were a last will and testament. Words cannot do justice to the range of emotions felt that night. 0430, June 3rd. Thick fog tucks to the earth as men keep to their units, hoping for victory, but fearing the worst. Bam! The shell goes off, and screams are heard. The thickness of fog hides it from view. The rattle tattle of volley is heard. Is that from the left or right? God forbid both. Just keep on marching. It's only a matter of time before you are in the enemy's works. If you are in General Barlow's division of the 2nd Corps, you soon drop down into the enemy entrenchments. You take your musket and either with a bayonet or make it into a club, Secure Breckenridge's front line. You watch the fruit of your labor, seeing several hundred prisoners in the battery fall into your hands. What a great victory! Three cheers! Hip hip! Get out! Is that a rebel voice? No, that was a New York accent. Min falls down dead next to you. Spot multiple balls in his back. Canister. You've never known what it was like to be on the receiving end, but you certainly don't wish to. You turn around, start climbing out, and you go down. What is that liquid? Blood? Is that yours? Black. You are in General John Gibbon's division. Fog makes it impossible to see more than the man before you. And then suddenly you can't. Was he shot? Did he run somewhere? No, he's on the ground. Still alive, just hiding. Is he following orders? Where's Colonel McKean? Someone answers he is dead. You drop to the ground, not wishing to join him, instead hiding. Fog begins to clear. You think you can make out a rebel man. You prepare your weapon. Take aim. You're about to fire. Then black. Your friend in front of you might not write down your name. But you're certainly in his mind when he writes. We felt it was murder, not war. At best, a very serious mistake had been made. You are in the Sixth Corps. The commander is apprehensive and doesn't want to assault. Good. You survived the terrifying charge of June 1st. It might be your lucky locket with the name of your wife written in it. She must be so lonely back at the Pennsylvania farm. And with no one to help during the pregnancy. You just need to keep your head low. You'll be back in time for the birth of, well, you don't know it. But your beautiful daughter, Abigail. General Upton is a good man. He won't let you die. You were even lucky enough to be defending back at camp, cooking up a nice meal. When you look out, your friend in the 49th is laying on the field, 
No time to think. You run towards him. The Sixth Corps is barely assaulting. How is this man hurt? A shell washing his shoulder soon reveals. The others don't even know they're being assaulted. He is truly unlucky. You try to pick him up, but he stops you. He knows he is dead. He hands you a piece of paper. Letter to his fiance back at home. You look over at his diary. June 3rd, Cold Harbor. I was killed. You say a final prayer for him before returning back to camp. You will return home to Abigail after a quick stop to hand your friend's letter to a woman who won't ever marry. You're congratulated for being lucky, never injured. Why are you so sad? Man up! Everyone sees their best friend's brutally killed. Just drink it away. You are in Smith's Corps. God, why did you create such ravines for men to march through? The men bent down as they pushed forward, as if trying as they were to breast a tempest. And the files of men went down like rows of blocks or bricks pushed over by striking against one another. Though you don't want to admit it, you're scared. The men behind you won't you run. Plus, it's a great cause to die for. This is your land. Though you might be from far away New York, this is American land. Pushing from behind, throws you to the ground. A little canister shot flies over your head. You can't feel anything up there. You move your hands to it. Well, thank Providence, it was just your hat blown away. Wait, why can't you feel your left arm? Quick glance notices it's three feet away. You will survive this. Get back home, live a good long life. Others injured are very cool for not continuing the fight. Sometimes consider yourself lucky to have lost a whole limb. Keep yourself from the public's insults. Then you hate yourself for not sticking up for your brothers. You're in Warren's Corps. We're advancing, allowing for the Confederate cannons to focus on General Smith's Corps. You don't know how you feel about it, but hey, you're not in charge. You watch as men are mowed down. Someone makes a glib joke about a fireworks show. You laugh as a courtesy. He is the Lieutenant Colonel after all. Then you see something that horrifies you. One of your comrades, a fellow Massachusetts man, has fallen down. You yell his name, Rob, and run towards him, confusing your regimental commander. You dodge bullets and shell and finally reach him. Wait, this isn't Rob. What? We're forced down. We hear through gurgled blood. John, do I see the mass of it? He trails off. You die in each other's arms. In tribute to your great friendship and camaraderie that never existed, you were buried together. Robert is in a grave a mile away. You're in the Ninth Corps. Though many commanders hate him, you love Burnside's cautious command. It has saved many lives. This land is familiar. You're from Maryland. You did business before in Richmond. Beautiful city. Hopefully your friends there didn't turn traitor. Charge! You advance against Jehovah Early's main force. It's so quick. Is that it? You guys sworn it was just a skirmish line. But who are you to judge? Uh, what is that? It seems a musket ball has been lodged in your foot. You go to a hospital. Amputation. Take a swig of whatever is in that bottle, and when you come to with a nasty hangover, it's gone. You wait in a medical bed. But you just keep on feeling weaker until one day, you don't wake up. If the amputation never happened, you have lived a happy life. But sadly, the infection took hold. You are in a box, in a field you never knew about. Oh, 0700 hours. Meade is in Grant's tent. Exploit the victory! Meade orders his corps commanders to assault, but none wish to hear it. None followed the order, with Smith calling the idea. Wanton waste of life. 12.30 hours. Grant concedes and writes to Meade. The opinion of the Corps commander is not being sanguine of success in case an assault is ordered. You may direct a suspension of further advance for the present. 1,500 rebels paid the price to repulse us. 3,000 to 7,000 new men paid for nothing. Grant, despite all his blustering, will go on to admit his failure. I have always regretted that the last assault at Cold Harbor was ever made. I have always regretted that the last assault at Cold Harbor was ever made. The rebels have won their great victory, though Lee does not share in the jubilation. 1100 hours, he receives a delegation from Davis. Postmaster General? Davis, I know your cabinet is mostly useless, but you don't need to throw them on the battlefield. John Reagan arrives and asks... General, if the enemy breaks your line, what reserve have you? Not a regiment. And that's been my condition ever since the fighting commenced on the Rappahannock. If I shorten my lines to provide a reserve, he will turn me. If I weaken my lines to provide a reserve, he will break them. Don't take this at face value. We never celebrate victories. And he does have reserves. 
He's exaggerating his desperation for more men. The fourth comes without battle. Sharp ears and howitzers fire away, but no charges. Grant tightens his line and wonders what to do. He is asked to get a formal truce so the wounded might be recovered, but that would require admitting he lost, and if one thing needs saving, it's Ulysses' ego. Finally, after days of trading notes, two hours is given to retrieve the wounded. This happens on the 7th. Many of the wounded are dead. Rightfully, Grant is criticized for this. The rebels probe the line of Burnside on the 6th and continue to pick away at their opponents, confident. And suddenly, Army Northern Virginia loses over an entire corps. What happened? Why was Breckenridge sent to Lynchburg? Why is General Jubal Ory asking to be sent with? Why are two cavalry divisions riding northwest? Why is Lee so scared? What change of events could have induced such fear in the victorious Lee? The Battle of New Market was a terrible defeat handed to us by the incompetence of General Fran Sigil. He has since been replaced by Major General David Hunter, who has been setting the valley alight, metaphorically, and sometimes literally, he has been tracked by rebel cavalry under John Imboden, who has now linked up with Officer Grimble Jones. 0600 hours, June 5th. Bang! The cavalry of Major General Julius Stahl have viewed their traitorous opponents, the 18th Virginia. Within the hour, they will have the secessionists running south. The pursuit will bring the two sides into a complete battle. Colonel Augustus Moore, whose brigade suffered heavily, the assault on the center of Jones's line. He's always success, pushing back a forward line, but his main assault is brutally repulsed. Repulsed is thanks to the heavy guns of the rebellion. Hunter orders them silenced. The artillery under Captain Henry A. Dupont of that Dupont family systematically singles out and silences the Confederate guns. The precision of fire was wonderful. Soon the rebellion's infantry faces the fierce shot and shell of Dupont. Moore is reinforced and tries a second time. He's once again repulsed. Sebastian's regiment surge forward for a shot apart by Spencer rifles. Jones starts to mass his troops for a real counterattack, but the aggressive hunter strikes first. Second brigade under Colonel Thoburn is sent against an opening in the rebel line. It goes unnoticed till a mere 100 yards from their opponents. This surprise breaks the Confederates, and Jones is forced to put in his reserves, which are immediately broken. He runs in trial them, but bang! Bullet goes through his skull. The rout begins. A mass capture follows. The great defeat of the valley is done. Jones lost, in addition to his own life, 1,600 men, of which 1,000 are prisoners. Hunter suffered only 850, and has secured three Confederate flags as trophies and 2,000 small arms. Six, he marches into the vital city of Stoughton. This is what scares Lee to his core. But there is more. The Battle of Old Men and Young Boys. Petersburg, Virginia the screeching roar of trains grinding into a halt. Former Governor General Henry A. Wise watches the transfer of supplies. Behind him is a ragged force holding the Dimonek line. Fortification is well placed on high ground with batteries and salients ready to break apart any assault. But again, ragged force. Bermuda 100, General Butler is bottled up south of Richmond, has lost all respect and hope for promotion. But he can earn it back. The Confederate capital is fed by the trains that run through Petersburg, the rail lines are cut, Davis could starve. The capture of Petersburg lay near my heart. Virginal Edward W. Hinks will take his division and sweep it to Petersburg, then followed up by cavalry under General August Cox. Hinks is a good leader, but General Quincy Gilmore, who has also a reputation to earn, requests to lead the operation. I was fool enough to yield to him. June 8th, midnight, a slow trudge of infantry begins their movement. The roads are terrible, and the movement slow. If the tree becomes lost. Also lost is the element of surprise. Three distinct discharges of cannons. The United States color troops are pushing against pickets, but by 0800 hours, the Union are in the enemy's breastworks. Old muskets sound off the ragged volley, but their fire is as deadly as those from modern weapons. Hanks receives word from Dilmar he has been forced to withdraw. Without support, so must Hanks. One to outworks of Petersburg, skirmished and returned. This leaves the cavalry alone. A charge, and came down to our breastworks with a yell, their drawn sabers flashing in the sunlight. When within forty paces of the fortifications, the order to fire was given, and the Yankees recalled and fell back. This charge was repeated twice, but with like results, when enemy resorted to a flanking process, which, by reason of his overwhelming numbers, he was unable to do with much ease. A short time afterwards, a regiment came around Rivers' house on our left. Another appeared on our right, 
and a large body came down in front. We had but 170 men all told, and it was impossible with this number to guard center, right, and left, along a length of three quarters of a mile or more. The order was given to retreat, and in a few minutes, the enemy had possession of our works and were in full pursuit of our men. Finally, some success. Rebels rush for reinforcements, but they are all too far away. Couts gets into the city, but the Petersburg artillery blasts apart the coordination of our men, allowing for North Carolinian battalions to repulse the final thing of the operation. Forty Federals lost, eighty Rebels, and gone is the hope for an easy victory. Though it does scare Davis. The indications are that Grant, despairing of a direct attack, is now seeking to embarrass you by flank movements. This query refers to the threat placed by Butler. But what can we do? He watches over a field of corpses at Cold Harbor. He's held down and beaten the main threat. Beauregard is meant to protect the capital. They had already dispatched Breckenridge to take care of the valley. He can't be everywhere at once. June 12th, Cold Harbor ends. The casualties for this battle are highly debated. But I do have to pick one. The Union lost 1,845 dead, 1,077 maimed, and 1,816 missing for 12,638 total. We lost 788 KIA, 3,376 WIA, and 1,123 MIA for 5,287 total. No time to cry. No time to mourn. March towards Petersburg. Leave your soul behind. Going from the bloody battlefield to the cutthroat world of politics, we must turn our attention to Baltimore, Maryland, for the National Union Party Convention. What is this new party? It's the Republican Party. In an effort to attract war Democrats has changed its name, and this works. Big Whig Democrats show up, including Governor Andrew Johnson. Someone important, not in Baltimore, is President Lincoln himself, wishing to keep his hands off the convention. Knowing his certification as the candidate is all but done. The temporary chair, Robert Breckinridge, an ardent abolitionist from Kentucky, father of four officers, two Union, two Rebels, and uncle to former Vice President, Kirk Confederate General John C. Breckinridge, opens the convention with a now-famous speech. As a Union party, I will follow you to the ends of the earth and to the gates of death. But as an abolition party, as a Republican party, as a Whig party, as a Democratic party, as an American party, I will not follow you one foot. Then follows the party's platform, which I will save you from reading in full and instead just give you the summary. Pursuit of the war until the Confederacy surrendered unconditionally. A constitutional amendment for the abolition of slavery. Aid to disabled Union veterans, continued European neutrality, enforcement of the Monroe Doctrine, encouragement of immigration, and construction of a transcontinental railroad. It also praised the use of black troops and Lincoln's management of the war. Next, the presidential vote. First ballot. Three California delegates vote for no one. 494 votes for Lincoln and 22 votes for Grant. Wait, what? My Missouri delegates, for some reason, voted for the General-in-Chief. Who is not running? Then quickly shift their votes, and Lincoln is selected unanimously. Finally is the vice president. The first ballot? Are we sure this is correct? Okay. 200 votes for Democrat Governor Andrew Johnson, 150 for Republican Vice President Hannibal Hamlin, and 108 for Democrat former Senator Daniel Dickerson. The rest go to journals like Butler, Rousseau, and Burnside, or to some politicians. After shifting, Johnson gets 492, Hamlin 9, and Dickerson 17. Johnson will be the vice presidential candidate? This is shocking. I know dropping the vice president during elections is nothing new, but usually it's because of a major falling out, like John C. Calhoun and Jackson. Y yes, I know there was resignation and everything where Calhoun wanted to break South Carolina away from Jackson. Hamlin isn't Calhoun. He was dutiful in supporting Lincoln in the Senate. While kept away from cabinet meetings, that is just convention. He shares a friendship with old Abe, though not his wife. Honestly, I would feel betrayed if I was in his shoes. The ninth, Lincoln hears of the convention's results and delivers a now famous speech. How many famous speeches are there this week? I am very grateful. I am very grateful for the renewed confidence which has been accorded to me, both by the convention and by the National Union League. I'm not insatiable. I'm not inalienable at all to the personal compliment there is in this. Yet I do not allow myself to believe that any but a small portion of it is to be appropriated as a personal compliment. Convention and the nation, I am assured, are alike animated by a higher view of the interests of the country for the present and the great future.
and that part I am entitled to appropriate as a compliment is only that part which I may lay hold of as being the opinion of the convention and of the league, that I am not entirely unworthy to be entrusted with the place I have occupied for the last three years. I have not permitted myself, gentlemen, to conclude that I am the best man in the country, but I am reminded in this connection of a story of an old Dutch farmer who remarked to a companion once that it was not best to swap horses when crossing streams. I will say now, however, I approve the declaration in favor of so amending the Constitution as to prohibit slavery throughout the nation. In the joint names of liberty and union, what is liberty to give it legal forms and practical effect? While the path to gaining such an amendment is a long and arduous one, the enthusiastic support of our Commander-in-Chief and the approval of by War Democrats via the party platform, the path is clear, and freedom for all is viable. As liberty increasingly becomes universal in the Union, President Jefferson Davis and his government are desperately trying to explain its weakening to their citizens. In response to a farmer on the 7th, I wish to prevent the oppression and redress the wrongs of the citizens, but I cannot hope to have effected all I desired. And the 10th, the Confederate Congress approves all men aged 17 to 50 for military service. This is pure desperation. The entire working age male population up for arms? The CSA clearly has no future. They have no economy, no production, no laws. Just a dogged determination to fight till the end. Fight? They do. Returning to earlier in the week in a state we haven't talked about in a while, Southeast Arkansas. Original Joseph Maurer is marching with his column towards Lake Village. He's under orders to take control of the town before continuing on to the river flotilla. Maurer hears the bang of a musket, followed by a bloody yell. Another man has died. His Confederate opponents have no hope of defeating him in battle, so instead they have decided to delay him and bleed him dry. The traitors run up with their loaded pieces, fire, and then immediately fall back to their commander, Virginal Colton Green. Our Federals have no good way to stop this. Chasing would mean the margin column would become split and open itself up to being defeated in detail. So they trudge along till they find the Confederate encampment. Artillery opens up and the order is given to fire. Finally, a set battle. Rebels instantly retreat. Maurer makes his way to Lake Village, spends the night, and then rejoins the flotilla just as planned, losing 180 men. Green also completed his orders, losing 100 men but delaying the Federals. Both sides won? Next up, we move north to Kentucky. Famed rebel raider General John Hunt Morgan is at it again. On paper, his mission is to disrupt the supply lines of General Sherman enough to slow him down and divert attention. But Morgan has only 1,200 men to do this with. And these aren't his infamous veterans, but a new lot. He still has achieved early success capturing a supply depot at Mount Sterling. But Thunderbolt, is that actually his nickname, is in for a shock. Bird General Stephen Burbridge is a harsh commander, a disciple of Attila the Hun. He strikes rebels at Mount Sterling. Confederate colonels are sent to reinforce. He beats back their counterattacks, then chases all remnants out of the county. Burbridge lost four dead and ten wounded. Morgan, eight KIA and thirteen WIA. A minor battle, but Burbridge wants Morgan's head. He prepares his men for battle. But that will happen next week. That was a fun cavalry duel. How about another one? Major General Nathaniel Bedford Forrest Graves victory. Yeah. I don't like Forrest, not as a commander and especially not as a human. I believe he is overly praised even as Confederate cavalrymen go, Stuart being far superior, but the battle Bryce's crossroads is the best showing of his skills. I'll be doing you a disservice by brushing through it, so I shall do my best. June 10th, dawn. General Forrest rides with his elite guard. He's under the dogged pursuit of Federal Commander Samuel D. Sturgis. The rebel riders are outnumbered and outgunned. But the Wizard of the Saddle is no stranger to terrible odds. His horsemen aren't running away from the Union, but towards it. I know they greatly outnumber the troops I have at hand, but the road along which they will march is narrow and muddy. They will make slow progress. The country is densely wooded, and the undergrowth so heavy that when we strike them, they will not know how few men we have. Their cavalry will move out ahead of their infantry and should reach the crossroads three hours in advance. We can whip their cavalry in that time. As soon as the fight opens, they will send back to have the infantry hurled in. It's going to be hot as hell, coming on the run for five or six miles. There will tr their infantry will be so tired out, we will ride right over them. 10 a.m. The advanced Federal Force of Officer Warren spots Tennessee cavalry. The battle has begun. 
Warren deploys his men in a line, as does Rebel Commander Lyon. Despite all the disadvantages he has, Forrest orders the assault. Pirate troopers surprise Warren, who has just been reinforced by Brigadier General Benjamin Grierson. Together, they conclude the ferocity of their opponent is a sure sign of infantry. Courier rides to General Sturgis, warning him of the great threat. General Sturgis is watching the construction of roads, when a breathless rider comes up to him. A letter is exchanged. Soon an entire infantry brigade is marching to Grierson's aid. Grierson, not waiting for the slow-moving Sturgis, has already called up a cavalry brigade to beat back the Grey Troopers. Two sides engage. The rebels determined to break our center continue to throw forward more soldiers. Sturgis on the road gets another letter. Hurry! Grierson's cavalry is broken, and BAM! Shells explode overhead. Already was the march too much for many men, but now it's become a march to hell. Finally, light pierces through the trees. Cavalry has clogged the road, but Sturgis and the infantry have arrived. Horace is also repairing his formation, allowing a brief respite from battle. Rustling is heard. The rebels try to surprise our Federals by sneaking through the forest. We're blessed in part by a thousand-man volley. The battle is back and forth. The concerted push breaks the Confederate flank. Bayonets! The Union officer yells. It appears as if the left has broken. Where is Forrest? The far right, but upon receiving news, the wizard wastes no time, running up and down the line, rallying his men, keeping up the fight. Then his salvation arrives, cannons, deploying them dangerously close to Sturgis. The commencement of canister shot signals the beginning of the end. Order soon gave way to confusion, and confusion to panic. The army drifted toward the rear and was beyond control. The road became jammed with troops and wagons, and artillery sank into the deep mud and became inextractable. No power could check the panic-stricken mass as it swept towards the rear. Black troops hold the rear, aided by two heroic white regiments. The 55th and 59th Guard Infantry form a line for the final stand. Soon they see all of Forrest's force bearing down on them, but they don't break or bend, and the rebels are repulsed. Under the command of Colonel Edward Boughton, they complete their task, and Boughton rides to Sturgis with hope. General, for God's sakes, don't let us give up so. What can we do? For God's sakes, if Mr. Forrest will let me alone, I will let him alone. You have done all you could, and more than was expected of you. Now all you can do is to save yourselves. Bowton's men only hope to save themselves is to surrender. Black soldiers surrendering to Forrest. They literally have to tear off their badges proclaiming, Remember Fort Pillow, hoping their captors will forget their criminal past. Sturgis's retreat is a terrible rout, and soon the Confederate cavalry charges his column. They capture Company's Hole. Forrest lost 96 killed and 396 wounded. Guess what Sturgis lost? Sturgis had suffered 223 men killed in the battle, half of them from the Black Brigades, 394 wounded, and 1,623 missing, the vast majority of whom had been captured. The Confederates, at a cost of 96 killed and 396 wounded, had captured almost the entire Union train of wagons and ambulances, 16 cannon, 29 limbers, 15 caissons, hundreds of rounds of artillery ammunition, 1,500 rifles, and 300,000 rounds of small arms ammunition. Horace has only his cavalry. Not understand how he could defeat Sturgis with 8,000 men. I will order them to make up a force and go out and fall Forrest to the death. If it costs 10,000 lives and breaks the treasury, there will never be peace in Tennessee till Forrest is dead. And on the topic of Sherman, let's see if he can snatch this week into victory from the failings of Grant and Sturgis. First thing for Tecumseh is securing his headquarters. He had asked Cavalry Commander Kenner Guerin to push Confederate Cavalryman Wheeler from Noonday Creek a week ago, but nothing has come of it. On the 9th, an assault by five brigades is repulsed twice, but it scares Wheeler from his position. On the 10th, Noonday Creek is secured by Indiana Infantry, allowing for the military division to turn their attention towards... Another prolonged contest must be had around the commanding spurs of the mountains that covered Marietta. I wish there was more to say. Oh, who am I kidding? I'm glad to report the 10th seat's only a federal advance. No battle. The march ends with shovels, not Springfields. Then, there are Sickles. He arrives in the capital of Arkansas. Governor Isaac Murphy had earlier asked Lincoln to keep our good general away from the state. But nothing terrible happens. A friendly dinner with fellow officer Steele, a review of soldiers both veteran and recruit, inspection of a gunboat. Murphy respected Daniel Sickles, probably hoping for a favorable report. On the 10th, Dan left, moving down south to New Orleans. That's where the week ends. And let's return to where it started, Cold Harbor. Now I want to state that this isn't the most horrific loss. Storing Gordon Rea, a man more intelligent, an expert on the overland campaign, and a gray fox, 
note that the daily loss of life is lower than Lee's at Antietam, Chancellorsville, and is nowhere close to that of Pickett's charge. With that out of our way, let's we'll take our time to be human. Men died, sons, husbands, fathers, even those who survived aren't lucky. I know war is hell on even a daily basis, but this, this, it's too much. It's just too much. Hi, it's the entire Civil Week by Week team here. I would just like to say thank you for watching this video, and I do hope you liked it. I really do hope that the Choose Your Own Adventure Cold Harbor section came across with the respect I intended it to. And I really want to ensure the message War is Hell gets across. I spend so long looking at these books, I feel the need to sometimes remind myself each casualty was someone. Thank you. I hope to see you next week.